and then but if you do have time like there's like one or two questions i'd like to ask her just because yeah, i'll, I'll asked ask him... him at the end i'll ask him at the end if yeah. he if he wants to yeah. robert wanted to ask you a couple of questions if that's okay because so. he had a debate a few months ago uh, against a Catholic on transubstantiation, and he lost. I, I know, I saw that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so like I asked like one or two questions, and he dodged him, and I thought they were good questions. So like I'd like to ask him again, and they're related to like uh, the debate. Um, so, right? Yeah. There's um. Yeah. Can I ask something? Sure. <laughs> Hi, Curtis. Hello. Hi, um, <clears throat> I have a question. In the Reformed view, once at conversion, not only is one past and present sins propitiated, but one's future sins are propitiated. Uh, is that a correct summation of your view? I'm sorry, you have. I don't. I don't, want to, I don't mean to sound this disrespectful. I, I can. Could you maybe reword that? Because I'm having a hard time understanding it. Oh no, that's fine. Um, in your understanding of Reformed theology, would it be correct mm -hmm. to say that? at the moment of one's conversion, that is, once their errors is be called and regenerated. Not only mm -hmm. are their past sins, but their present sins, but also one's future sins have been forgiven. Is that correct? I would say yes. Then how do you reconcile that with First John 2, 1 to 2, which is addressed to believers, where mm -hmm. it's clear that their then future sins have to be propitiated? Would you mind reading it? Well, let me... I mean, sure, I'll read it. I'll read it for you if you want. Okay. You have any preferred translation? Okay. I can read it in ASB. I'll read it for you. Uh, this is from the NASB. Uh, my little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate or a paraclete with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is, present tense, the propitiation, the hilasmus, for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Uh, so how do you make sense of this passage? I'm not talking about universal atonement necessarily here. I'm talking about right. the forgiveness of then future sins after conversion. Right. And so the, the, the way I would explain it as shortly as possible is that all sins have been, for those in Christ, all sins are forgiven. But what John is saying here is that when you do sin, what you what you have to realize is that Christ is your advocate. So that, so you have to understand like there's this great idea in their mind that like oh we sin, we we like what are we to do? And what John is saying is that Christ serves as your mediator, and he's not caught off guard by your sin. And the reason that I feel comfortable to say that we have assurance of future sins be, being forgiven. It's because we can go into the presence of God with the assurance of the pardon. So those people who are not clean have no assurance. So as you would know in the old sacrificial system, when you sin, you have to keep going to the temple, the temple over and over and over again. Because Christ perfects those who draw near to him, his blood is not only sufficient for what they have done, what they're currently doing, but what they will do. So the, the, the Christian is therefore presently justified with God, which means that God doesn't hold his sin against him anymore. And on that pretense, this, the believer, when he or she dies, has therefore a future hope because of their current justification. And because we will eventually sin again, Christ's sacrifice is sufficient to cover all sins that we have are currently struggling with and will struggle with and will do again in the future. That would be my answer. But but again, the text presents Jesus for believers, not potential right. future believers, but believers as a present tense propitiation, which right. shows their future sins have not yet right. been propitiated, correct? Right, but Christ also prays, as you would note in John 17, as a high priestly prayer, that he doesn't just pray for those who believe now, but he prays for those who would later believe. So but Christ is, is not just all believers. Say uh, what? Curtis, Curtis, that's going to go to this again. In Reformed theology, one's future sins are forgiven and propitiated at conversion. Is that correct? No, that's correct. According to First John 2, 1 to 2, speaking to believers who, in your view, mm -hmm. their future sins have been propitiated, John is telling them they have a present propitiation for their future sins. How is right, that not an inconsistency? 
because Christ is and, and, already. And can there. you deal with the text? Yeah, Christ's propitiation wasn't just for now; it's an eternal propitiation. So Christ is not just dealing with your sin now; He's dealing with all of your sin. Because if Christ doesn't deal with your future sin, you actually you have no you would have no hope of a propitiation to begin with. So uh, Christ is not. Um, how does your answer not lead to hyper Calvinism? You said Christ is a eternal propitiation. So how does that correct? But in your view, one sins are propitiated in space and time, correct? Correct. Not, you have not been eternally justified. You are eternally justified before God. Mm -hmm. Upon conversion. So you're playing you're playing word games now i'm not because y yes you are no, because well, if you've been eternally you. justified that means you've been inter justified since the eternal past i wouldn't say that and i reform people wouldn't say that so i'm saying hyper calvinists would and a lot of i'm not i know i know but yeah, the I'm logical conclusion would be hyper calvinism so i'm going to ask this one more time i'm going to okay. ask this one more time okay according to okay and i want you to answer yes or no According to First John two one to two, he's addressing believers, correct? Right, that's correct. Believers at the moment of their conversion, you know, once their errors is be called and regenerated in Reformed sure. theology, their past, present, and future sins then and there have been propitiated, correct? Correct. Okay, so while they may fall under the fatherly discipline of God for their future sins after their conversion, there is no propitiation needed for their then future sins. So why wouldn't there be need for propitiation? Well, in my view, their then future sins are not uh, forgiven at conversion. Okay. Their past and present sins are. But in your theology, their future mm -hmm. sins have been propitiated. So why okay. speak of this as a present propitiation for future sins, which is what be first John is doing? Right, because Christ time. knows, hold on, because Christ knows you will sin in the future. But God knew sense. that. God but knew their sins in the future. Hold on a second. But their, God but their future sins have been propitiated. Right. After after you convert, all of your sins, past, present, and future, will future. Be, yeah. are taken care of yeah. upon conversion. Okay, so can you make... in Okay, so in light of this, how does this not contradict any sound exegesis of 1 John 2, 1 to 2? It's not. But Jesus is a present propitiation for then future sins of believers, correct? According to First John two one to two, right? Because he he pays okay. for all he pays for all of your sins when you convert. So there's no what? sin that there's no sin that's that you will commit, have committed, or already are presently committed that Christ has not forgiven. And the biblical text supporting that would be right because you are justified now. But justification is not a simply a declaration, correct? No, it is a declaration because you have peace with God because your sins are forgiven with Him. Well, so how there sins. there cannot there cannot be an eternal promise if there is not an eternal sacrifice that is standing there as your advocate upon conversion. In that worldview, then you would have to say that future justification is a non-existent thing. But what I'm saying is, Paul says our pardon is assured to us. Well, how can he say that with certainty if sin is not taken care of fully? No, that you're reading way too much into that. No, I'm, I'm not really. I, 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 I want to be civil, though. How can you be assured of a pardon that you don't know will be effective in the future? You have no, that's no, I read that Paul doesn't work. I, no, I wouldn't say that. I'm saying Paul says First we are now therefore, I'm saying Paul says we are now therefore justified, right? Is that what not he says? Yeah. Okay. Therefore, that, so that does justification peace. undo itself because of future sin? If it's a heinous sin, yes. Because in Roman, that's Romans 5, but if you go back to Romans 4, he uses two examples of justification, Abraham and David. And I should ask this, in your view, when was Abraham justified? The moment he believed. When was that? Genesis 12 or 15? I would say that's Genesis. I would say Genesis 15, but some, some Reformed theologians would argue Genesis 12. But you believe it's Genesis 15? I would say it's Genesis 15. Okay, so prior to that, Abraham was totally depraved, correct? Correct. Then how come God offer, uh, accepts his sacrifice in Genesis 12? That's a good question. So I would say that God said, so what does it say in Gen Genesis 12? Just to give me some backdrop. So I want, well, I want to be able to... Well, basically, uh, God calls Abraham 
Um, Correct. And according to Hebrews 11, this is where he has saving faith to, bro to borrow from Protestant terminology. And in the Reformed Order Salutis, it's only after justification one receives saving faith. Then he builds an altar and God accepts the sacrifice he offers. Right. So how is that consistent with, unless of course justification is progressive, not just simply a once for all event. Right. Then on that basis, then you would have to, I would have to logically say then, then Abraham, Abraham is justified prior to Genesis 15. But if that's the case, how, uh, and justification is once for all, is Paul wrong in using Abraham in Genesis 15, 6 as an example of justification? Correct. If again, justification is a once for all external legal event. Right. So, so I would say when Abraham acted on what God told him, he was therefore justified. But he wouldn't, so he wasn't justified prior to that? So in Genesis 12, I would say he was justified because he believed in what God would say and he moved, he was moved to do as God commanded. Okay, so if he was justified in Genesis 12, how do you make sense of Genesis 15, 6, where it said, and it was credited unto him as righteousness? Because it was credited to him as righteousness. What does it mean to be credited to righteousness? That's justification language. So I would say so, to be credited. So that so what I would say in the sense that it's credited him as righteousness, what it's saying is that God is giving him a righteousness that is not his own. But there's not in the phrase and it was credited unto him as righteousness for imputation. Right, the, you, well, the, you, the Bible says it was reckoned to him, so it was given yeah, yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah. Kashan for the so, Do you know where the only other instance where that phrase is used in the Old Testament? No. Are you aware of the story in uh, Phineas? I am. In Numbers 25, Phineas, just for background for those who don't know, Phineas sees one of the members of the uh, House of Israel, or one of the Israelites, I should say, take a Midianite woman into his tent and he kills him with his javelin. And that propitiates God's anger against the camp. And in Psalm 106, 30 to 31, it's recounted and it said, because of Phineas's action, it was credited unto him as righteousness. Correct. Okay. How is that an imputation? But because it's based he, on his action, not his faith. Right. Right. So if you believe faith to be, so are you, would you then say, therefore, faith is therefore an action and not a gift? That's an either or fallacy. I would say, I would say, I would say because, and this is where the, the continuity of James 2 comes in, that we are justified solely by what Christ has done. But unless one acts upon what Christ is offering, you cannot be justified. So one, so so Christ is offering justification, but unless you believe in that justification, you will not be made right. So man has a responsibility to do oh, what God but, has commanded. Uh, so that Curtis, he you said justified. made right. Don't you Say mean what? declared right? Don't you mean declared yes. right in your theology? Not made? Right. Because in so your view, God declares someone righteous when they're intrinsically not righteous, correct? Correct. Which is legal fiction. Correct. Okay, I'm glad you admit that. I, I, does, I'm sorry, like, this is fun, but like, does anyone else have questions or is it just going to be me and Curtis? 